Gale Force is one game away from being able to take the second seed in our standings, meaning they will only have to play one series to determine if they can go to the midseason bra. And they want to just keep that ball rolling. But it hasn't always been the, it, it's a bumpy road that the ball is rolling on, right? Like sometimes it jumps over here and they have to be like, no, 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 let's go back over here, especially after game one. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's, it's a ball they don't really have much control over. You know, I can't tell along who who's along for the ride, really. Is it them? Is it the ball itself? It, it's, it's gotten out of control here in this series for freedom. And for game number three, what could be match point, Gale Force is going to be taking us to Cursed Hollow. Cursed Hollow is a battleground where we see some Illidan play from Gale Force, some Abathur, Greymane too. And versus Tempo Storm, they did like to play their mass global effect, but things didn't work out for them to plan, especially when they needed to fight. They just didn't. Yeah, that was uh, a really strange game uh, out of them on Curse Hollow. The fact that they hit a debatably game losing slash winning curse and they didn't even attempt to stab towards that tribute, not even questioning if they wanted to move in that direction. So. I would say that is a prime example of showing Gale Force maybe not having the necessary decision making on Curse Solo, something that Freedom might look to punish. Have we seen much Freedom on Cursed Hollow since we've started 2.0? I'm trying to check here. There has been one also preferring having Greymane, Zeratul, Falstad. So global contention again between these teams. I've got a theory that Gale Force Esports is either going to ban or definitely not pick Greymane in this game. And a lot of that has to do with the Zagara ban of the last game. When we were discussing whether or not Gale Force, how much do they show, I feel like half of their strategy for not showing is not even leaving it as like a question, they just ban out against themselves to some extent, right? Like things that they know are good on the map, for instance, but something that they don't even want to show where they view it in value overall, they want to leave that as kind of hidden, and ways you do that is take high contested heroes and just not even let them be an option. Where do you think, for instance, like a gray main would fall? Just not even give it to freedom. Right, being willing to ban Zagara seemed like such a statement to yeah. make versus freedom, where they have played Zagara every single Braxis holdout game so far in part two, and then casually ban, just a casual ban. We're not even, we don't need this. You don't know if this is what we need. It was a cool statement to make. It was very much a cool statement to see come out from them. Malfurion was the first pick of Team Freedom, and we still have a lot of globals on the table. My first thought for Free or Gale Force is going to be that they're gonna pull back to that global game, that they'll stick more to that macro play, one that we know to come out of them from time to time. Curse Hall is a map that you can get away with it, but again, it's sticking to their stereotypes, and that's all they need to do, is fill the role that they expect the projected playoffs team to um, half of them, and that is going to be through an Abathur Greymane. So they aren't going to commit as hard as I, I was hoping to see, you know, just ridding of that. They're going to stick with their Abathur and with their Greymane. Well, objectively, this is such a strong duo to have. Abathur Greymane, and it's available. Yeah. That might raise more suspicions if they didn't pick it, I guess is what I'm trying yeah, to say. That's it's a good point. It's such a strong duo that everyone knows that if they get the chance, they're probably going to take it, even if they were trying to mess with the minds of Team A and the other teams looking at them for playoffs. And another thing I didn't consider before throwing out, you know, conspiracy theories is the fact that, uh, you know, Greymane, Abathur, Zagara were the first three heroes they had picked in their last Curse Hollow game. So not only is it objectively a very powerful strategy, but the fact that They've already shown they have interest towards that type of composition, allows them to pick up a strong comp with, again, not showing anything. So where do they move in terms of the bans? I've often talked about what I want to see freedom ban whenever you're against the style of composition, that being material. But for Gale Force, do focus on the back Do you want a material ban? Yes, I do, in fact, want a material ban. Even though Gale Force Esports almost exclusively plays Judgment. I have faith that they learn how to hit Control 2 and not how to hit Control 1. Okay. Doesn't matter, he is not even going to be an option. Materials removed from this draft phase. Gale Force here 
What else do they want? Last time we saw them go with these two, they had the Zag, but then a Murden and a Brightwing. A Murden and a Brightwing. Brightwing really. might still be a possibility, but Murden is gone. AFK, actually, he's still around a keyboard. He'll be played by Zagrug. And without Tyrael, that does limit the pool of Equinox a little bit. Um, has played some Arthas, but say, we've gone away from that. Uh, but with Abathur, maybe still a possibility. That's what I was going to say is that, you know, Arthas is still looking good in this composition. You would want him with typically another beefy kind of melee and a backline to help. And they might not have that much breathing room in their draft to be able to get away with that. But they do have some powerful picks still remaining. Where does Gelforce want to go? Diablo and Genji. That's showing some things. Sure is. Why Diablo? Of all the t all the warriors to go in and be like, you know what? I'm going to mess things up. I'm going to start this fight. Diablo isn't necessarily the best to compliment that of a Genji. That'll be that's a that's a curious one. I honestly I don't even have an answer for it. Not even not even a theory. Normally I can make an argument, but I don't I don't see it right now. We've been seeing a little bit of Diablo here and there, and mainly that is on Infernal Shrines. Not so much here. Yeah, on Cursalo. And the weirdest thing about it is not only is it a weird Diablo map, it's the more more to me, it seems stranger the fact that that was with the Genji, right? Uh, that it's just one of the last heroes I can think of like wanting directly with a Genji in terms of warriors to accent him. I think this will be Uther. Yeah, it very much should be. It is an insane power pick. I don't think it could be much else. They go with the Uther, but again, that Diablo matching the Genji to provide that secondary threat. Uther, or Genji is a different hero when he has Uther on his team. I think he is far more viable an option whenever you do pick up a Genji, but it's more, I, I I don't know. I, I don't know where the Diablo comes from. Just again, you always want a secondary threat. We saw how quickly in the last game. I think that's the easiest example to look to. If you just experienced last game, how many times did Genji just get blown up? Nobody was up there to be scary with him. Nobody was out there doing damage with him. Nobody was there to keep him alive. And he is very easy to be able to respond with. And when you have, granted, limited amount of warriors to pull from, I just didn't think that that would be the direction. Tyrael's probably most optimal. Murden's the second most optimal. Also gone from you, but... It's a weird map when Arthas is still up. You know, nobody maybe could fill that role necessarily, but it's a weird map and it doesn't fit in the Genji. In both fronts, it's out of place for Gale Force. My first immediate thought is maybe Apocalypse to lock people down. And once Diablo builds up his souls, then he sort of can dive into the back line and be a threat and allow Genji maybe to be able to do his own thing, especially with Divine Shield. But this definitely seems like it will be more of Greymane being a backliner, maybe even going so far as to get Cursed Bullet, since there are two warriors for Team yeah. Freedom. We're ready for game three. Can Team Freedom get the win here and keep their lives in this series alive? We'll find out. Hashtag how to throw. 101, giving you lessons here is going to be Gillyweed. <laughs> keep their lives alive. On the mic That's here. That's generally how you want to keep your lives. Uh, yeah, I like my lives alive. alive. Me too. And, as well. <laughs> Small change there coming out from the Abathur on his level one. The fact that we see him moving to that, not into Locus, is what we've seen most of the time in part two since Abathur has risen in HTC North America. And pressurized glands gives more range to spike burst. It also reduces the cooldown. So lending to maybe more things like Soma Transference at 13 to help with the supporting, given the fact that Uther is cooldown dependent. Also maybe even at 16 to limit, uh, or well, really enable the chase by slowing down opponents that are hit by those Venom spikes. Already a small adjustment that we've seen out of at least North American Genjis is the fact that at level one, we're going Pathfinder. Jumping over terrain uh, with his passive, in fact, is going to give him 25% movement speed for six seconds. What that allows you to do, especially if you move into the secondary charge, is pretty much fly across the map. Your mobility is not only that much better, but actual literal mobility across the map. Your rotational ability mobility is accented with 
this build. When I was looking at this talent, I specifically was wondering if we would see it here on Curse Hollow. There, It's a very big battleground, so that kind of mobility is amazing. And then to add to that, there are a lot of places and walls to jump over on Cursed Hollow, and you can just be like, surprise, surprise Genji. Hello, how are you guys doing today? Oh, you're dead. I'm sorry about that. What that does do for Genji, though, is makes him that much more of a one-trick pony when it comes to his heroics and approaches to fights when looking at Gale Force's composition. Uh, based on the fact that he doesn't have the mobility directly after his initiation there uh, and moving in with his E, and then it makes it to where I'm expecting a Dragon's Blade here that we have an Uther so he can dive into the back line, get as much damage out, but there's no skirmishing with that mobility to ensure you got your own reset anymore. It just makes you an ult to get that secondary reset, then walk away after the D shield is wasted. Whereas, again, traditionally with the other level one that we see, that mobility really helps with follow up shurikens, with making sure you get the auto attacks to get your damage done, and positioning properly for your protection. Meanwhile, I thought that we would have more of a ranged focus Greymane, but in fact, he is building still into more of the Worgen build that we traditionally see, having Wolfheart for the increased cooldown of Inner Beast, uh, Eyes in the Dark for Disengage, Zagreb is going to be fine here, and this early game has been a strange one so far. Yeah, the laning matchups here has been really mirrored of one another, but Freedom is just opening up the map. Insomnia is causing problems up on bottom lane to the Abathur. This is what we normally see with Abathur early games, but not this was way and not to this extreme, right? The fact that not only we're missing two forts for both sides, accelerating the rate at which level 10 is going to be picked up. Normally 10 doesn't hit until that third tribute. Now it's going to be hit right after the second one. That is just moving back. Do we see Dahaka brush shock in or do they give up this tribute and just poke so that Dahaka can slow soak and eventually Team Freedom are hoping take that mid fort. Definitely would like to see him rotate as long as at once the fight even gets close to starting, which is going to be right now. Just based on the fact that that fort is going to die. You should view that as already obtained experience, right? Unless you need it for a power spike like 10, which you don't in this area, or at least not in this point in time, not worth the force. They get the fort and they get the tribute. It's a double win here for Team Freedom. Gale Force Esports starting to eke ahead in experience, but it is a small amount just trying to get level seven. Although pressure his glands was grabbed at one, no uh, adrenal overload. Still focusing on getting um, the, the Toxic Nest talents at four and seven. So I'll have the increased slow from that and more of the nest to be able to give vision just like this over the boss. Yeah, the vision of the boss, Gale Force, has moved outward to try and deny a bit. The scouting drone may reveal Fan, but he's just worried about the boss itself. Night Camp is going to be pressuring out through mid for freedom here on the secondary tribute that's going to be spawning top. This is this early game. I'm trying to, I feel like somebody's got an advantage more because of their composition and the way the map is played but I can't figure out who yet. Yeah, uh, Abathur oh, would love that, that those are down. Vault goes through, though. Abathur loves that forts are down because he can try to put more pressure on keeps. Uh, both have a fort down in a boss lane. I think it benefits Gale Force just because of the Abathur the yeah. most, honestly. Giving him that free area to kind of mess around with. This tribute is going to be channeled by Collusion and Equinox. Throws out the Flame Stomp fan actually going in for that drop in the Protect. The flip over the wall, there's going to be the Self Shield coming out from Dainsky. He's fine for now. Abbott, they're still soaking, but there's Insomnia. Does he get a drag? Crowen gets the dodge. Eyes in the dark up soon. And there's going to be a channel for Collusion. Zugger took a lot of damage. Fan trying to go in and get his reset. The Tribute was picked up by Collusion in time. Gale Force Esports hoping that they could at least maybe have gotten a kill because of how long Freedom stuck around, but that is not the case. So the next tribute is Curse Point for Freedom. It is going to be Curse Point here. I'm trying to really think about the way that this game has kind of unfolded so far here and what, what can Freedom do? Because my biggest fear here is what we've experienced not only in the games one and two of them getting ahead and then getting kind of pounced on, but this is also compositionally different than games one and two, considering Cursed and what Gale Force has. 
uh, they have a very good win harder composition and can snowball the map and be very oppressive whenever they get a lead. And I'm trying to figure out there is something on the side of freedom that they can do to avoid. Oh my. So Zugrug went and stole They're the vision good. away from Gale Force Esports. Fan has now showed up, but the nest showed that Team Freedom were here. It's way too far down for Freedom to go away now. Equinox shadow charges onto the point. This is going to be the fight. There's no heroic abilities. Gale Force allows the boss to be taken by Freedom. Thankfully for Freedom, Gale Force wasn't closer to Tim. This is time for uh, Abathur to be able to soak, but everyone makes it out. Everyone did manage to make it out. Surprisingly enough, and that is a good sign for Gale Force as they lock in their first tribute of this game. They're rounding out towards 10. Crone getting stunned out mid follow up roots. I don't know if he's going to make it out here. A lot of healing coming out from Akka, not even needing the D shield. Beautiful disengage in Gale Force and Freedom back out. But Freedom got not only Giants pressuring top, they've got the boss pushing out on bottom. They're really sticking it to Gale Force here, even in game number three. Yeah, they pulled so many resources to come up and make sure that Crowen stayed alive. That And they stopped Crowen from being the defense versus the boss. That They got a lot more from that now. Giants being cleared out. Freedom knows that Gale Force was going to look to clear this. So hoping maybe they could get a pick while pushing along with those Giants. Here are the heroic abilities. Reign of Vengeance instead of Strafe. It is the Dragon Blade you mentioned for Genji. And Apocalypse for Diablo. The Dragon Blade plus Uther's Divine Shield. This is the version of Genji that I expected to see if we saw him in North America. Just having that Divine Shield, uh, it makes him, I mean, if you couldn't tell by my tone yet, me and Gilly have had a lot of conversations of where Gilly, or Genji falls. Overall, right now, I'm, I'm not sold. I'm not on the hype train of Genji uh, in a lot of ways, but I do I have a lot easier time supporting him if I see two things, uh, either Ethereal or Nuther. Yeah, you have an easier time supporting him if they are doing a good job of supporting him. And Divine Shield does do that with Dragon Blade. Here we go. Apocalypse, Collusion in trouble. He's going to go down without a doubt. Oh. But how he does it, that Twilight Dream, he's still alive. Fan is about to go down. Equinox is out. Aka face down. At least he can heal and got the Divine Shield out in time. Clone is out of here. Malfurion finally taken he out. But at what cost? Just <laughs> wrecked Gale Force with that Twilight. That was exactly what I was talking about, man. Let's just take another look. Look at this thing. I have never seen, look at the momentum just die. Boom. And everyone's just like, uh, how do we get kills? How do we get kills? Nothing's dying. Uh, all right, we lost the fight. My goodness. And that was a bit when we were talking about the burst of Gale Force Esports by having the Diablo, how overextended he maybe has to go in to try and force those team fights. And a quick rebuttal from the Twilight Dream. But a curse has been achieved now for Team Freedom. The Expulsion Zone was also excellent yes. in that to try to make sure that Collusion could stay alive as long as he could. And I'd love to talk about Dainsky. Zarya I didn't quite get to in the draft, but he is currently 5-0 and has never died on Zarya in HGC yet. Flexing on him. There's going to be a stun into the wall. Follow-up rebuttal. Good root follow-up. Fan goes in a bit deep. There's going to be his dash over the wall. Keep in mind, and only having one of those, minus a swift strike. Dahaka has been conveniently absorbing that bottom keep. This is so well done by Team Freedom. They're ahead in experience. They're feeling good despite being down two games in this series. Showing Gale Force what they can do in Heroes of the Storm, how much they've improved as a team, a new team with a lot of new members in the professional hero scene. The early like D-Shield, very early D-Shield and dive under the back line is gonna be fanned. The boss falling pretty low. Dansky eating a bit of damage, drop in an early repulsion zone. Apoc ends up landing, go for the throw is gonna be real. Twilight Dream ends up landing, hitting on the three and now Gale Force ends up falling once more, but at the cost of two members of Freedom. Zugrug dives over, catches Fan. Nope, he jumps over the terrain. And with that increased movement speed, mounts up, gets away. Equinox running back to help defend with Abathur and Genji. Again, collusion with the plays. Ice block to stop Apocalypse so he could Twilight Dream out of it. He's stepping up He's here for fire. his team. Dainski took a bit of damage there. Fan not necessarily having the burst on his own, especially with the abilities taken there. Traditionally, with the single target shuriken at 13, you can secure some of those isolated individuals or, you know, the 2v2 skirmishes become a lot easier because you can falsely position yourself right next to them, hit all three shurikens, get that bonus damage. But a different build from Fan, and so far, 
even with the Uther, not looking too hot. But a lot of that's coming down to, you know, just, let's be honest, collusion. It, I, I wanted to say Team Freedom, but it's just collusion, really. <laughs> it really is. Collusion is, he has been, I swear, every time, every Malfurion game we get from him is just more and more awesome of plays from Collusion. And Team Freedom using that to their advantage. They've had a curse. They have taken out a keep in the bottom. They are well on their way to 16 ahead of Gale Force Esports. And Gale Force only has one tribute, so it's not even like they could hope to sneak the next tribute and get a curse. All windows seem to be closing. At least, you know, we're setting them halfway. Boss check here from Freedom. Tense moment here over the bottom boss of whether or not it started. Who's going to start it? Freedom. Gale Force sniffs it. Freedom will hang around all day. They have to Haka to limit the Abathur. And with that keep down, Gale Force can't really afford to leave this either. And Freedom knows it. Oh, this is a risky. Oh, no, that there's route. No world I don't like that route. Even beyond that route, there's no world where Freedom needs this boss. They've already got to keep into Haka's split push. Yeah, they're just trying to keep Gale Force here. They, they keep stepping back. They're trying to keep them here. They are trying to keep them there. And they're keeping them effectively busy, really, on the map. Genji skirted his way over to steal this tribute. Thanks to his high mobility. It's just Freedom is out macroing Gale Force Esports, which I feel like I almost need to say again to believe it, but they Why are. Why do it? Go ahead. <laughs> it's a, that freedom is out macroing Gale Force, but they have only gotten one keep, and you, it feels like they're hitting a moment where they realize they want to macro, but they aren't absolutely sure what they need to do. Catch out onto Zugrug. There's going to be the first flip. He goes back in, dro throws down the Thunderclap. 16, Expulsion Zone. Crowin in a terrible place as he's blown up. Once again, from the Twilight Dream, Clone went down to Equinox in trouble. No way to dive yourself out of this one. He will respawn in a few seconds, but this gives time for Team Freedom to get that boss. They've been hanging around for so long. Team Freedom very comfortable to back out and take this. No one to contest in not a minute and a half up until Gale Force's boss is going to spawn. So what do we see? A unwinnable game when it comes to the boss with this push on bottom. It takes fights, it takes forcing fights. There's no way Gale Force can stop this. They don't even have APOC. No, especially with all the shielding. They're going to go the in. Healing. Divine Shield, Dragon Blade. He's just go looking for kills now. Nazmus might be that kill they need. Nazmus goes down. Dansky flipped. He got the first pick, and that might be enough to snowball. Fam might just turn up here in this fight. If they can get somebody low, Dansky falls, but Equinox a little bit too low there. Man, if Dansky had not had popped that shield, that would have been a dead collusion, a dead Dansky. But surviving there allows Gale Force to back out, get rid of the boss, a tribute going over to Freedom. Top boss up in less than a minute. That's it. That's going to be a tense one there because that what that will do is it's timed with the third curse, which is going to be a Gale Force curse. So now it's one of two situations. It's a game losing play if Gale Force can not only win a fight, pick up the boss and the tribute through top if the tribute spawns up on top. But if it spawns on bottom, Team Freedom is in a tough spot because then again, they have to forfeit either a boss or a tribute. Warning, tribute's worth more than the boss this early on, especially on the side of Gale Force. Here's where a fan can turn up like you were hoping for because he got Steady Blade at 16. That increases the damage of the next Swift Strike with how many heroes that you hit. You can stack that up to three times, 20% each. So if there is a possibility of Freedom grouping, in positions over bosses, like we've seen before, trying to group up and get Collusion into Twilight Dream, then the next one might just be able to get those kills right away. But so far, it's been hard to bust through all of the shielding and the healing and the tankiness, the sheer tankiness of Freedom. What do you think Gale Force is feeling right now? What are they thinking, right? Because they're obviously trying to stall out the game, but my thought process is for what? You know what I mean? Is there a 20 spike that stands out? There is, you know, you've got the hive mind. hive mind. Genji's pretty neat with his 20 options. Greymane's okay. Diablo's above average. But nobody's, nobody stands out crazily. And Team Freedom matches them in the same department. Effective 20s. But Gale Force here is very comfortable giving up. Like, the fact that they've gave up that last tribute on what could have been, I told you, like, the boss curse game-winning play. They gave up all those options purely to clear and soak. 
If I were looking at where the talent tier, the power spike might come in, I would say it would have been 16 because yeah. they have Executioner to pair and combo with Uther and Diablo. There's a lot of stuns possible there, especially if they land the right Apocalypse. There's slows from Abathur too. So I would have guessed it was the 16 and we may see them. We should see them. They are starting to funnel down. So yeah, they're looking to take this fight. But see, Gale Force just gave up a curse where they weren't risking it. I'll talk about it later. This is insane. Either way, Team Freedom delaying for now. Good zone and route coming out from Collusion there. Tahaka with a safe burrow. There's Collusion. Gets stunned before he can drop Twilight Dream. This is the difference that Gale Force Esports needs with that double gray main. Also, Fan just dropping everybody from Freedom like flies with the Divine Shield Dragon Blade combo. Gale Force Esports will get their first curse. And quickly, not even just backing up. They want to end the game. They're going to sidewall and go. This is it. They don't want to win. Oh, never mind. Avatar's getting that. Don't mind me. They're good. Either way, they sidewall here. They're going for the keep. They're still going for the game. Avatar's just getting this tribute. Can they end? Freedom will have Twilight Dream out of this as long as he can land it. They have to kill Fan. There is no Divine Shield. So fans got to go down or crow in one of the de damage dealers, but it's not game, at least not yet. I don't think so. They're going fully on to crow in. There's no divine shield Six to keep seconds. them alive. Shields just now falling. Apoc and EPU, Zugrug, door toss is out, 75%. There's going to be one kill. Collusion is now here to join yeah, 35. Yeah, the root first stepping in, Twilight ah, Dream. That's game. That is going to be it. Gale Force Esports, in fact, is going to be able to take this series 3-0 to zero over Team Freedom. Clean, but maybe not as much as I, I know I wanted and definitely probably Gale Force had in that series. You know, they, they won every game. They sure did. They got the win, but maybe, you know, not as precise, not as dominant every game. The fact that most of those games came down to a losing the early game, winning one like almost B-Step-esque, you know, I, I don't think they feel comfortable after that. It's weird how clean whoever was in control had it continued to be in control until someone dominantly stepped in and won a team fight and would rest that away. But throughout the games, whoever was in control, it looked just so clean and so clean. And then either one team fight would happen and all of a sudden freedom grab that control up until cores. Up until cores. Well, cores with bosses. You yeah. know, you gotta keep that in mind. They get baited by the boss, you know? It's just they aren't the only ones. Honestly, a lot of just in general, the boss, number one, it's named a boss. All right. Number two, <laughs> he does crazy cool things and he takes a lot of people to take down. So when you take him, you think he's going to be tough, like, you know, the king of tough town. And he ensure is not, you know, minions actually are the, the secret heroes of Heroes of the Storm. Nobody really knows it, but their damage output is what's needed. So if you guys are playing at home and you want to end the game, if you don't have minions behind you, probably can't do it unless it's 20 minutes if he sort of tricks you like that would you say more he's like the joker of tough town yeah like yeah he's kind of yeah he's the he's the one he's a poser of it you know he's trying to step in he's trying to be the tough one <laughs> and then quickly the real guys the minions just walk by be like, get out of the way kid well let's check in with someone who not only has just won a series I but heard he got a haircut. Ha yeah had a haircut looking good crowen congratulations <laughs> how are you guys feeling about that series because it did seem like there were moments where team freedom could bring it back and even take games from you guys uh yeah first of all uh, thank you very much you had to get a haircut but um yeah the series wasn't as convincing as i think we were expecting team freedom played well it showed in their prep work say like um we banned the zagara thought they were might have gone that so i don't know they did their prep and it showed but i think we still got the advantage in times where they misstepped and that's why we won well talk to us about the diablo what was the mindset beyond that pink that pick well, Diablo is actually like really good in that composition that we just ran with the diving into the opponent's team and just like securing kills really fast in fast fights. It makes sense. Dre, do you have any questions? Uh, uh, just a lot of what I had to ask was about Genji. You know, where does he end up falling? Because we've seen Genji played. I don't think we've ever had a hero who was just available and seen in every region so far. So just from your guys' thought, you know, what is your initial feelings onto the Genji? Where does he fall? What do you guys think? I think Genji is a very strong hero just in the impact that he can have. Genji has a lot of burst damage, he can poke, he's very mobile, and he fits into a lot of compositions right now in this current meta. And that's why I think he's being played in a lot of regions and having a lot of success. All right, thank you.
Well, last question from me before I let you give shout outs. Let's talk playoffs. You guys are for sure now in second place, so you guys will only have to play the single match at the end of playoffs. Who do you think you're going to play? And what do you believe you need to do to ensure that you'll be going to the midseason brawl? Um, I think it's likely that we will be playing teammate. Not 100% sure because it, anything could happen. But prep that we'll be looking to do to then is just same of what we've been doing. Just sort of improving on the mistakes that we notice. Like we're going to go over everything, try to research as much as we can about the teams. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Just keep prepping, keep working hard, and hopefully we'll be able to make it. Great. Well, congratulations, Crowen, on you guys' victory 3-0. Uh, good luck in playoffs next weekend, and shout-outs before we let you go. Yeah, of course. So first off, shout-outs to Courtney. She helps us out with a lot of prep and analyst stuff, so she's a really, really big help. Shout-outs to all my team. Um, I'm going to be streaming later today at twitch.tv slash Crowen, fan streams at sc or twitch.tv slash sc2fantv. Michael at Michael Udall, Equinox, Equinox Hots, and Akaface. Give him the Twitter follow at uh, Akaface Hots. And also, shout outs to our sponsors. Uh, thank you, Gilforce, 